All right, we have Lori Gilhausen from uh, ACMC, and she's here to give us her favorite pie recipes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, she's here to talk about diabetes education, so that's sort of why the... Uh, the lame joke. <laughs> yeah, but that's okay because this is that time of year where you just got to kind of decide. You know, people, you know, if, if you blow your meal plan, be honest and say you blew the meal plan. Because mm -hmm. Thanksgiving actually is technically one dinner out of seven coming up in this next six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and everybody wants to blame their lousy A1C in February on the holidays. So, you know, that's only four meals, five meals. Mm -hmm. out of 75 meals <laughs> so it's not quite always just thanksgiving that messes it up for you well there's the leftovers the day after well, and yeah. christmas and all that good stuff and it's being diligent with what you choose uh-huh you know this is that time of year where maybe something fancy with sweet potatoes is the only time of the year it comes if you got any say in what goes on the table don't put the white potatoes out. You have white potatoes every day. You don't get your sweet potato pie every day. Right. You know, it's stuffing. So but two kinds of potatoes is bad. Yeah, you and while, like, let's face it, you've got stuffing in the turkey if you're doing stuffing. You've got your white potato, you've got your sweet potato. Stuffing is a carb as well. And oh, then, it's all the carbs. They're all carbs. Whoa. They're good for you. That's the only way your muscles will let you take that walk after dinner to walk off mm -hmm. all that good food. But if you get too many of them, yeah, you're not that's be, our problem. You're not going to be walking to Wisconsin, so... Yeah, that's true. Maybe all the way to California sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, then some people unfortunately choose the vegetable mix that's peas and corn and pasta. Well, those are all starches, too. So if you got any, say, have broccoli or oh. green beans instead of a starchy vegetable along with the potatoes. How about cauliflower? Is that good? They're a non-starchy. All right. Yeah, and your salads are I, good until so you drown them in dressing. <laughs> peas are starch, but green beans are not. Right. And like Whoa. lima bean, kidney beans, the, the, the navy beans, uh -huh. those guys are a starch, but they're a twofer. They're actually a threefer. They're high in fiber, which helps slow down how fast the carb part gets to you. They count as a protein because they have some protein part to okay. that regular things mm -hmm. don't. But green beans... You know, if I, I have to be careful because I'll say beans and everybody thinks green beans. Right. Green beans are your free food. They're like your cauliflower, your broccoli, your leafy lettuce, vegetables. Um, they're a free food, technically. Because you'd have to they're... eat like two cups of them to get any carb you have to count. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's... And what about like uh, chickpeas? Those would be the three fur thing, too? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're a starchy <laughs> vegetable, but they're high in fiber and they count as a protein, too. They're good in salads. Yeah. When you can find them in the refrigerator. I had a salad last night, but my wife put a turkey in there and had so many other things. I looked in the refrigerator and said, it's not worth looking for. <laughs> and you know, that's, you bring up a good thing when it's leftovers. And this is a, tr it's a trick to help people, help you do better with all your meal plans. You know, whether it's for blood pressure, cholesterol, or diabetes, put the better things in front. When you're hungry, waiting for the microwave. Oh, that's you a good You know, idea, yeah. if the veggies are in the back behind something not as healthy, you're going to grab what's in the front of the row first, and never mind the apple in the back. You're going right. to grab what's up front. Or if it's on the counter because it's cookie season soon. Cook your cookies, but then pack them up in Ziploc and freeze them. Mm -hmm. That way in July when you go, geez, I'd really like a sneaker doodle cookie, you don't have to bake four dozen cookies. You go to the freezer and you pull out four or six or mm -hmm. you know and, and using your leftovers you know the turkey is a lean meat and of course the serving size is the palm of your hand oh yeah, yeah not not the big drumstick but somebody's going to enjoy that drumstick <laughs> on thursday <laughs> <laughs> and then of course it's the pie will be a carb and a fat too yeah so you know if you really want the pie be very gentle on the starches on the plate save it for where you want to spend it so is that, are you going to have that much turkey? Well, three ounces of lean meats okay. are a serving size. <clears throat> Guy's hand is usually about four ounces, uh -oh. a woman's hand, a palm. You know, the size of the palm, oh wait, I should go that way for the TV, and the depth of your hand, that equals about three ounces of cooked meat. And that's all you need at like breakfast or lunch and dinner. So if you're a bachelor out there and you're making your own dinner, <laughs> go over to the neighbor lady's house and... Um, to have her stick her hand out. <laughs> that or if you've 
got the plate size steak because that's what you decide your Thanksgiving dinner is going to be. Cut it up four ways. That way you can have steak and salad later and you didn't have to do a dish and wash it. Oh my goodness, you have to wash the dishes afterwards too. Oh yeah. But that's exercise. Remember we talked that's about right. physical activity. Our, our dishwasher gets, it, it goes like four times on Thanksgiving. Yeah, and then there's still the dishes that can't go in the dishwasher. So oh, yeah. You only bring those dishes out twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, you know. so, so tell me about, so what about the people, can people star themselves before oh. that? And then and that's... No. You can't cheat. Thank, thank you very much for bringing that up because that, that is truly one of those false things that happen. You know, you check your blood sugar. A lot of times people only check it once a day. You never see what your blood sugar does later in the day. But our body truly sits there and says, I need a gas station, stop here. I need a gas station, stop here. You know, food is the fuel that makes our body work. And when we miss the gas station, the body's got backup plans that say, I'll take care of business because you couldn't take care of business. And in diabetes, that balance that used to be there, it's like gears that aren't meshing. They don't work, and so all of a sudden the blood sugar gets too high. A misconception is, oh, my blood sugar's high, I guess I won't eat. Mm. It might be high because your liver is breaking down your muscle you just built doing those dishes to feed you. Mm. And the liver's going to keep putting sugar out in your system until it has enough insulin to finish. Now, maybe it's high because you had all of leftovers. You know, you had two pieces of pumpkin five per, per breakfast instead of your egg and toast. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of carb difference there. Um, sometimes it's high because it's stress. You know, it's cold and flu season. So stress will make it go high. The holidays can be stressful. Yeah, That's it's stressful <laughs> with the family, with the stress. And even if it's wondering where your next meal's coming from, it's a stress. Right. But it's, did you take your medicine? Did we walk? You know, there's more to that higher blood sugar number than just the last five minutes or the last couple of hours. You know, so it's, did we take our meds? Because sometimes we forget, we're stressed out, we might well, forget yeah, our meds. Well, Thanksgiving isn't exactly your typical day and people are doing things differently. So if you do this, this, and then you take your medication, do this, this, and then it all gets thrown off because it's Thanksgiving. And, and like you started, we, like we started the conversation, you're thinking, <clears throat> I want that pie and I want the potato, so I'm skipping breakfast. And supper, lunch isn't going to be till 3, so I'm skipping lunch too. So you get to that table at 3, you're starving. Or you planned on that turkey being done at noon, and we all know how that works. Yeah. Sometimes turkey isn't done till 3 or 4 in the afternoon. So please have your breakfast. Please have your regular lunch. You know, if you come to the table starving, you'll eat more. You know, and some families eat that later dinner while you finally get everybody together. And yes. so please eat at your regular meal time and then you can still have like snack or nibble at that meal so that you don't come to the table starving. Now, all the, all the suggestions you have here, are these for everybody or are these just for people that have diabetes? Actually, they work for everybody. The newest trend, unfortunately, is not that that's so-and-so's thing because they have diabetes and this is all of ours because we don't. <laughs> we all need to eat the same balanced plate. You know, as much as we hate to say it, we all need some non-starchy veggies in our life. We don't normally get enough of those. We can all use fruit for dessert mm -hmm. because there's no fat or salt added. It's whatever was in there naturally. We all need that small portion of meat. Sorry, <laughs> I know, I just bought no assistance there. And like a fourth of your plate could be your starch of choice. You know, hopefully making it the less processed. You know, Thanksgiving kind of fun because it's usually, we peeled the potatoes that didn't come out of the box. Right. If they're out of the box, they're going to damage it, whether you've got diabetes or not. Or they might buy you diabetes faster because you tend to eat more of them. And then they slam your sugar too high. And then your body takes a while to catch up and bring you down safe again. You're talking about the fruit, and I've had some doctors on this show the last few weeks that say, well, we used to think that, that fruit juice was good for you. Now they at meals, drink water, drink water. One, one guy says that his son um, lets his son have a little glass of juice, and if he needs more to drink then, it's water. water. It's water. It's water. So you're talking and about I'm sorry, fruit. I didn't bring my fruit. I didn't bring the water, the, jar, the glasses. If you drank fruit mm -hmm. juice, the serving size is half a cup. Mm. Four ounces is the same sugar 
as the tennis ball sized piece of fruit. Okay, so you know, so sugar wise, a four ounce piece, a four ounce apple, a five ish ounce orange is the same sugar content as a four ounce half a cup little tiny glass of juice. The challenge is when you eat that fruit, when you look it up, you can't see through it. So you're getting the fiber. You're getting the exercise of chewing it and peeling it and all of that. When you're drinking the juice, it's down the hatch. Our body sucks it up like a sponge. Mm -hmm. And within like 10 minutes or so, we've just shot our sugar up 30 to 50 points. Now, if your blood sugar's low, you know, you kind of said, hey, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait to eat, and all of a sudden your blood sugar's too low before you got to dinner. Please use a juice. Of course, only four ounces of a juice. Right. To bring your sugar back up to the 100 that it needs to be. You know, if your blood sugar is under 60, then you could have a cup of juice because I want to get your blood sugar back up to 100 as quick as we can. What about if, it's, if the juice has got grapes in it and they call it wine? <laughs> wine is different. Unless it's ice wine, then that's a whole different conversation. But oh, that is, that is, that's not sweet. <laughs> um, wines, they taste sweet, but carb-wise, they're not a lot. But you bring up a very good point. Alcohol needs to go with food. And safe drinking for women is only like four or five ounce glass of wine. Sometimes you'll see it listed as five to six ounce glass mm -hmm. of wine, but usually it's like five. So women get one, guess how many guys get for safe, moderate drinking? Guys can have two. Ooh. Yeah. So there's one advantage to being a guy. <laughs> one. Women live longer, but guys can drink more wine. <laughs> but you want to always do that with food because the trick with alcohol, even if it's a mixed drink, you know, then the hard liquor serving is like an ounce, ounce and a half of a hard liquor. The challenge will be the mixer because if it's straight, real pop, then we've added a carb. Okay. Um, beer. It's a carb, but I don't want you to go, well, I'm having a beer, so I'm going to skip the potato because my beer is going to be my carb. <laughs> this is just alcohol. The liver treats it like a poison, so it gets rid of it first. It doesn't pay attention that your blood sugar is going low. Mm -hmm. So okay. you feel fine because you've had that's, a glass of wine. That's a good analogy, yeah. You know, but you don't realize a day or two later when you see a blood sugar that's really low that it's the alcohol a day or two before that it could mess you up. Depends on what else is going on in your life at that time too. I was at a dinner a week or so ago and a, <laughs> the hostess was talking about it. We were drinking wine. Yeah. And um, she was talking about how she bought her kids, all her kids, these things that are like $29. Oh, she found them on sale someplace. Yeah. But that, that you can check check your uh, alcohol, you know, blow oh, into the, the things. Yeah. So she bought them all for her kids and she says, I tried one of those, one glass of wine. And I was like, I was legally drunk. And yes. She said, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, and, and that's why the limit is different for women. Um, the way our bodies or composition is, we don't metabolize the alcohol out as fast as men do. But still, you don't feel drunk, but you legally you are after yeah. one. And you're supposed to wait a couple of hours, and that's the weird thing. We don't usually wait. You know, it's like drink, go, eat, and yeah. off on to the sure. next thing. You know, because even guys, it'll be kind of fun if they've got that all around the table at Christmas or Thanksgiving and go, okay, how long does it take to finally get the alcohol cleared down to safe again? Because you don't feel impaired, but you right. are. It's just like high blood sugars. Lots of people have lived with higher numbers, so their body got accustomed to higher blood sugar numbers. So the first time they get to something safer, it doesn't feel good because their body got used to up here. So that little dip down... It, it's uncomfortable. So it takes a while to get used to that clearing being there. Same way kind of with the alcohol, you don't think you're impaired. The high blood sugars, you don't realize you're not concentrating as well or that your coordination isn't as brisk uh -huh. as when your blood sugars are safer. You know, when they sneak up too high, you, you don't have that concentration well, or the vision. You know, you have trouble seeing and... With, with guys, it's kind of a macho thing. Oh, I can put it away, and I can drive, and I'm fine. Yeah, and no, we're really not. Which is kind of scary, because, you know, on the Internet, they made it easier to find how they can demonstrate. You know, here's how they, like, driving thing. There, they used to be on the TV. They'll show oh. commercials that mm -hmm. this time of year where this was doing this obstacle course without one, and then here's doing it with one, or with the funny glasses that change how your vision changes. But well, yeah, moderation is the key. Why is Keith Richards still alive? 
I don't know. <laughs> but you know, heredity is a big piece of diabetes. And it doesn't mean that you're going to be, you know, if everyone in your family has diabetes, it doesn't mean that you will get it. Uh -huh. And you might have nobody in three generations that had diagnosed diabetes, mm -hmm. and you get it. You know, there's just something with certain people's bodies that it goes for so long, and then it says, sorry, I can't do it anymore. And has waves the white flag and says, help me out with the measuring cups. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you know, uh -huh. that balancing out our plate, taking that walk, getting tested. You know, it's one thing to say, well, if I don't get tested and find out, then it won't bother me. Because diabetes and blood pressure and heart disease, they do the damage slow in the background. So by the time you finally notice that you're having trouble reading the signs on the road or the newspaper and you've gotten new glasses twice and it didn't fix the problem, it's blood sugar causing the problem. You know, for blood pressure, it can be the stroke or the heart attack. You know, the white stuff was on in the air lately, so please be careful. Shoveling snow is harder than a stress test. It's hard, oh, yeah, you know, especially yeah. if you sit there and go, I got to do this whole thing today. You didn't shovel snow yesterday, so you're not going to be able to do the whole driveway, maybe even the whole porch, today for snow. You know, one or two shovels and done. Go back out another hour later. You know, listen to your body. That hard to breathe, that, oh, this is just something's not quite right. And most of us skip breakfast and then think we can shovel the driveway and then go on our merry way. You didn't put gas in the gas tank to supply right. shoveling the driveway. It's not going to work. Well, maybe we won't get any more snow. That's true. The woolly bears did say we were going to be kind of nice. Well, we might be okay. The weather channel says we're going to have warmer than usual, but yes. <laughs> who's usual? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but when, when, the, when the year is over, when the winter is over, and they say it's been warmer or cooler, I, I don't usually see it. It doesn't seem that much warmer. It doesn't yeah. seem much. It's, it's cold. Yeah, it is. We'll, we'll come back. We'll talk about some of these things. We, I, some more like the signs of diabetes and, okay. and the importance of exercise and all that kind of good stuff. Good. All right, we'll be right. Gilhausen is with us from Ashtabula County Medical Center, and we're talking about diabetes and Thanksgiving. And how about reminding us about diabetes and, and the signs? And, and are there always signs? Sometimes there's signs, sometimes there isn't. It's like high blood pressure then. Yeah, because by the time you get signs from high blood pressure, it's been high for a while. But generally, when the blood sugar starts to go up, you notice you're more thirsty. Because you got to think about when your sugar's getting higher, it's like thicker and thicker syrup. Mm. And your body wants to water that down. So you're drinking more. So through the summer, if your diabetes showed up in your fall visit, it might you might not have paid attention because you know in the summer you're sweating more. It's hot, so you're drinking liquids. So it makes sense. It's hot outside. I'm drinking liquids more and more. But you kind of notice a thirst that just no amount of water will make it go away. And unfortunately, before you get diagnosed with diabetes, your favorite drink is probably milk or pop or juice. And you're like, well, I'm thirsty, that wasn't enough, let me have more. And all that does is keep popping the sugar higher and higher because those have carbs in them. Um, the other thing you might notice is that you're more tired. You know, at the end of the day, you're lucky to get to the chair and fall asleep. And you had no intentions of sleeping in the chair, but you wake up a couple hours later and go, oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, you lose that energy because there's nothing in the cells, getting to the cells as good as it should to clear the deck of the extra sugar, but to give you the energy to do things. So some of the early signs are very subtle. Some of the signs are just, you know, knowing their family history. You know, unfortunately, the older we get, the longer our beta cells in our pancreas have done the job, they get tired. You know, they've said, hey, I've done everything, I've covered all the business you've handed me, and it just can't work as well. So sometimes just changing up the plate, mm -hmm. adding an activity, and I know that's a terrible thing to say at the end of a work day, but sometimes just five or ten minutes more each day or little chunks throughout the day will help balance the deck better. So you don't have to start taking insulin or... Some people need insulin uh -huh. because the cells don't make any insulin on their... enough insulin or none. Type 1s, they have to have insulin to live. No amount of good food choices, no amount of knocking themselves out with exercise is ever going to take away the fact they need insulin to live. Now in type <clears throat> 2, 
you might get to the point where you need insulin to live and sometimes you need it right away and sometimes it takes 10 or 15 or 20 years some people never need insulin some people do but it's always how fast did we find out the problem because the fun part in research is they're finding that if the first day your doctor said hey there's a problem here let's watch because there's a spell of pre-diabetes now where your blood sugar in your lab is a little higher than normal but not so high we call it diabetes that's called pre-diabetes it's like diabetes is knocking on the door saying hey i'm on the radar yeah you know and we can choose whether we want to let it in or not like a vampire <laughs> not quite that bad but yeah similar. yeah we're close to halloween here um, but you know there's things that we can do that turn it around there's studies that show that getting that 150 minutes of exercise of activity moderate you know i'm the nurse if you don't walk now, I'm going to say start with what you can do. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not going to be enough to keep diabetes at bay forever. It's Is enough to build you up to start to fight, to walk to like you mean it. You said 150 minutes. Is that... A, a, that's for the week. For the week. So, oh, like 30 minutes, five days a week. Oh, okay. That's... In the world of diabetes, I'd like you to do something every single day because your body will be more balanced if your activity and everything is more balanced now some people go oh 150 minutes let me just work out two hours on saturday and call it good <laughs> well you know if you don't normally do two hours a day about an hour in, about first half hour in your ankles your back your knees are all saying what are you doing to me <laughs> wait wait a minute what is this and then you hurt so bad you're you never going to do it again. Yeah. That's why. So there's an analogy there with uh, I'm going to skip all my meals and eat a bunch of turkey. I'm going to do all my exercise and then forget about it. Right. And now they're finding that even if you did wake up that extra hour early to hit the gym before you go to work and you sit at a desk job most of the day, you kind of start to negate all the benefit you had from that one chunk of exercise when you don't have that activity dispersed throughout the day. So it's not like we have to get knocked out, but there's finding like short bursts of intense things. Okay. You know, um, maybe you're going to clean a room up because you've got company coming for Christmas. If you're going to wash the walls, don't do all four at once because let's face it, you don't wash walls every day. Pick one. That's enough for one day. You know, a couple hours later, maybe go back and do the second one or the next day. But build on what, you know, start with what you can do. Give yourself the gold star for doing it. Mm -hmm. And then if it is only five or ten minutes, do it two or three times a day. A good spot to do it is that five right after eating. Because then it'll help the stomach move that food down and around. And you gotta clean the table off anyway. So So maybe people should be taking like a fifteen minute walk one time of the day and another fifteen later on. Or? They could, or five here, five there, you know, walk one loop around the parking lot before you get in the car to go home at night. You know, if you're doing groceries. Does that really walk. work? Does that really help? Yeah, and parking at the farther end or, you know, from the door. You know, back in the day, you used to have to walk the cart back after you took it to the car. Yeah. Now you could kind of, you know, the cart parking's farther out from the door. Right. So, you know, you've got those extra If you go to Wegmans, they got those roof things on there. You probably live in there for a while after you put your cart in there. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, when you, when you're, the hard part is when, you, when you're stopping and shopping, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you read this one or you looked at a price and down the road they've got the same thing and you're like, oh, wait a minute, that's, a, you know, you picked up the first item, but then it's cheaper at that other end. That back and forth adds some steps, but it's not, not enough to lower the blood pressure, lower the um, cholesterol, lower the blood sugar. It just tires you out. But it's still, get the muscles moving. Mm -hmm. It gets the muscles moving when we've got that snow and ice. What are you going to do? You don't want to go outside and fall. So march in place. Even if it's the day the back and the hips and the knees say no way, sitting in the chair, picking a foot up, putting it back down, pick the leg and the foot up on the other side. The slower you go, the more muscles you use. It's not biggest loser, but it keeps the muscles moving. Soup can arm lifts. You don't have to go and buy weights. It doesn't you matter what's water. in the soup either. Can, right. You can have all kinds of sugar and salt. And Buy the worst can of soup you got because then you know you're never going to open it and you've always got your weights. Or water bottles are a wonderful thing. Sometimes too, just, just what your range of motion of your arm is. Sometimes when you're watching exercise videos, they've got their arms over their heads. Well, if your shoulder stops here, like mine is stopping here today, that's where you stop. You know, it doesn't matter that the show is saying, hey, put both hands up and do this. 
if you can only go here, that's wonderful. But maybe after you do that a few days, you can go higher. Yeah, you'll notice if functionally you're able to, you're, you'll be able to go higher. But you know, the fact is we don't use a muscle, we don't use a tendon, we don't do a certain motion. The body doesn't keep the muscle to do it. So paying attention to, okay, the body says here's good enough. That's what you do. That's what I can do. Cross the front. Maybe you can go all the way. Maybe your shoulder and hip say stop here. Marching in place. If you can, stand up and do the march in place. But Hold tell on. everybody to put the, their cameras away so they don't video it. You yeah. Put it on Facebook or something. And, and be careful <laughs> if you're trying out a treadmill or a bicycle for the first time. Remember to go slow. You know, there is no winning if you end up falling or getting hurt by going, I need 10,000 steps, I'm doing it tomorrow. You know, most of us only get 2,000 steps. Yeah, but think with all of the new apps on your uh, phones and your um, wristbands and all that, mm -hmm. that people are going to go out and they're going to try to beat the world and they're going to say, oh, my neighbor got so many steps and went so many miles and I got to do it no matter what. So that could be a little uh, dangerous. It can be, but it can also be inspirational. Yeah. And you know, that's the hard part. Like sometimes <clears throat> it's hard to do that exercise at home. It's the same four walls you see all the time. So sometimes joining a group or coming out for the Health for Life in January when we start mm -hmm. that, um, coming out in that small group, even if you aren't the best person in the class, don't keep up with that best person until you build the strength to do it. But seeing someone else, and believe it or not, you are that inspiration for the other person that's fairly new and learning the coordination and learning the steps. And it can be more motivational to go and do it because you're going, I want to see if that person's there this week. Or you're there and someone else is depending on you to be your inspiration to go, you're there doing it, I can do it too. Sounds like one thing is that if you, you are concerned about this and you want to exercise more, it shouldn't be a dreading, oh, now i got to exercise. It should be, i got goals and I can't wait to get out there and make it into a positive thing. I'm going to feel better doing this. I'm going to brag to somebody that I've lost weight and you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the hard part when you're first learning and as you first make these lifestyle changes, the weight may come off if you do it safely. Sometimes you just feel better, but that scale has the nerve not to move yet. But you're moving. Mm -hmm. So that's what's important. You're moving. Give yourself that credit. And you know, the day you're kind of like, oh, I feel sick today, maybe I won't. Just give it five minutes. And maybe you're okay after that. Now, if you've got a fever and you're throwing up and diarrhea, no. no. You know, you're going to do liquids, mm -hmm. clear liquids, please, until you're feeling better. But if it's kind of like that cold, you know, like, it's a stuffy head. I don't know if I want to do this. Try it. Give it the three to five minutes and you'll probably be okay. And if you're done at five, that's good. But you're right. Calling it exercise just kind of makes it another task to do. But finding it a way to make it physical activity or a positive spin on it um, makes you more like you want to do it. You know, and, and the first person you beat is yesterday's time. Yeah. Not, not the neighbor across the street or your person sitting next to you on the treadmill at the gym. It's my time was this yesterday. Can I meet it today? Maybe I feel good enough today to beat it by a little bit. You also, um, I wanted to at least touch on children and diabetes because it's more of a problem, isn't it, than it, it used to be? And, and aren't kids getting it younger? Um, well, kids tend, well, we used to always tend to say type 1 was in kids. Um, but the hard part is, is that you could be 62 and get type 1 diabetes. It's that, you know, once again, you have an infection and your body's immune system destroys the cells that make insulin. Mm -hmm. So we are learning that it doesn't matter if you're six months old or I 66 guess. years old, you could still end up with type one, but the one that's new in children is type two. We used to kind of say type two is you didn't really see it till the 40s, 50s, 60s. You've lived 40, 50 years of eating and drinking anything you wanted and then the body kind of says, I need okay. help. But now you can be, I think, as young as 10 years old and have type 2, which is a little scary because now you're thinking at 10, you've got 80 some, 90 some years to live with this blood sugar challenge. Now it's controllable. Right. I mean, out of all the diseases we have, it's the one that 90% of it is what you do every day. 
And you know, let's face it, we're the boss of us every day. We right. know if we did what we could do to the best of our ability. And we know if we asked for help when we needed it. You know, so that's where diabetes education comes in. A lot of times calling it education, people think, oh, it's school. Yeah. I hated school. Right. I don't want to go to school. It's adult learning. And even if you've had diabetes for 20 years or 50 years, there's still something new because just in the last two years alone, we have had so many new drugs come out that help you manage the diabetes better. There's better monitoring techniques. There's better pattern management. And sometimes when you're the one doing your own homework all the time, you may not see a pattern where if you come in have a meeting with me or other, any other diabetes educator, mm -hmm. um, we can sometimes point out a problem area that you maybe didn't realize because, you know, you kind of don't always see the whole forest when you're stuck in one section of the trees. <laughs> the pattern management, what is that what you were just talking about? Well, a lot of times we're so focused on the number I have right now. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the A1C test that's your three-month overview, that you maybe only get the once every three months or once a year at the doctor's office. Or, you know, a lot of times people don't even record their blood sugars. The meters have a memory, but the meters have a memory that's a grocery list. It's date, time, number. Well, you know, a week later, if I said, okay, it's two o'clock and the, your machine said 125, tell me about this. You know, what was happening? Because the number before might have been a 250 yeah. and the one after it might have been a 50. But here's this 125 in the middle. You know, first, is the date and time right? If you're not keeping a log, you don't know if this is that one odd time that two in the afternoon was really two in the morning because you didn't set the time right on the meter. Right. Or sometimes the meter's off like seven and a half hours. So it's not even like you could just say, okay, move everything over one meal. But you're looking for a pattern. Also, you know, that even if it's one time a day in the week, is Monday through Friday, pretty safe and Saturday night, Saturday morning not. Or Monday through Friday, the numbers are all over the place. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they're great. You know, looking for what's different about those chunks of time. If you keep a log too, you're gonna maybe remember like, this is really high on Wednesday at two. What did you do differently? And your response is, was that the day I visited Aunt Martha? Or is that the day that I went out to lunch with the girls? No, that was, uh, I don't yeah. remember. <laughs> exactly, and that's why the, the next piece next to it, and, and put it off to the side, but put a note. I had the flu this day. I felt great this day. I walked, I did shopping. Um, Aunt Martha had took me out to dinner and we had a good time. You know, I felt rotten all day. Put those little, you know, depression and diabetes goes hand in hand. We also live in an area where we just lost what little sunlight we do get to most of the time. So yeah. depression and seasonal affect disorder get in the way. You know, the, the, the challenge with diabetes is, is it the higher blood sugars that make the depression worse? Or is it the depression and the stress of trying to manage everything? You know, it's a double-edged sword there. But put that note, good day, bad day because you're not going to remember. If I sit, even two days later, you know. What did you break. have for dinner? Exactly. <laughs> what did we do for, did we skip breakfast this day? You know, or a lot of times people will start to feel funny. So check your blood sugar or at least mark it down that you felt funny. Because sometimes, you know, some people will share, so-and-so is eating all the time. Well, so-and-so is probably having blood sugar drops without checking. They know they have diabetes. They took a medicine. So they think they should eat. Now granted, then they look at their blood sugars, they're high. Maybe they needed to eat because their medicine kicked in, started to drop the blood sugar. We didn't quite get to safe, but it's that sudden mm -hmm. drop. You know, the symptoms of a low blood sugar, that shaky, sweaty, something's not right, uh, irritability. <clears throat> you know, sometimes somebody grumpy in the chair. Find out if they have diabetes and their blood sugar is shifting too much. Um, sometimes that can be at your high, sometimes it's low, your meter is your best friend. Check it and find out. And then you know, hey, I ate this, and two hours or four hours or six hours later, I had this problem. Medicine, you know, when you change up your plate, we may need to change your medicine. Your activity has changed. You're not outdoors watering the plants or walking to the mailbox as much. Right. We may need to change your meds now. So once again, with your monitoring, you've got that tool in your hand that says, how am I doing? 
You know, and it's not a good or a bad. The numbers are your tool. It just says, is you what don't I'm yell doing at working? Never. Never. Hey. And even if you're going to sit here and tell me I don't care what you want to mm -hmm. me to do, I'm not doing it. I'm like, fine. Let's work with what you can do. You know. So, do you... you you're a diabetes, you work in diabetes education, so does a doctor do test and find out somebody has a, a diabetes and they say, I want you to be with Lori now, or is, is that pretty much what... It can happen that way, or it can be the person that has it, at, you know, and they're just kind of like, I'd like to see diabetes education. Mm -hmm. Give me a call. We do need an order from your doctor, but I will do that for you if you want me to. Or you can do it yourself and you can see your doctor and say, hey, I'd like to have diabetes education. Because your Medicare pays for a dust off, you know, a, a plan check. Every year you get two hours with the diabetes educator and you get an hour with the dietitian if you have Medicare Part B. Mm -hmm. um, the very first year you're diagnosed when you are, <clears throat> not diagnosed, the very first time they order diabetes education after you've done med joined Medicare, Part B covers 10 hours. And granted, they want more of that in group class than the one-on-one -on -one be like how to use your meter. Or if you need insulin, that's more one-on-one. -on -one. Because that's, you can do it in a group, but it's a little bit harder because everybody's learning needs and skills with the fingers and that are a little different. Right. And so sometimes it's confusing if I'm showing you your meter and the other person beside you's got a different meter. And I've already told you how each meter is different. Right. So I've, I've, I've run into that too many times doing that in a group <laughs> class. They're like, well, I don't have to do that. It's like, yes, you're right. You're doing your meter right. They have to do this with their meter, and it gets a little confusing sometimes. But sometimes in that group class, you get a little more of that, I'm not alone. Yeah. I mean, honest, one in, one in, one in, ten, one in 10 or 1 in 11 people have diabetes. 1 in 4 don't know that they have diabetes. Whether it's they just said, I don't believe my doctor, I'm going to go find somebody else, or they don't go back after they've been told there's a challenge to face. You know, and the pre diabetes is even more scary because it's one in three of us live with our blood sugars just that hair higher, and about half of the people that have pre down the road will get diabetes. They find that like 15 to 30 percent of the people in pre diabetes will have diabetes in five years. So that's kind of very interesting statistics yeah. for that time of period where, and type two, you, you're healthy, you're working, you, you don't go for your physicals unless we do one at your plant or your office and get that general blood work. It could be a little high. That just means we need to take some action now to reverse it. At the beginning, change in the lifestyle has the most direct impact for the longest haul. You know, that time of period where you're like, I don't really buy into it. But if you bought into it, changed it around, balanced things as best as you possibly can, we can postpone the problems. That's a good incentive for not having to deal with the problem. Yeah. yeah. And that's the whole idea with the prevention pieces of all the diseases now is if we can make some small changes. And they truly, it, it's, it's the worst change in the world because we ask you to rearrange what's on your plate. Add a few vegetables. Mm -hmm. And if you're not a vegetable person, I have to tell you, sorry, look at a half an empty plate then. <laughs> Honest, because the vegetable most people want to fill the plate up with is all the starchy guys. You, know, you can't Potatoes quite Potatoes and corn and... Uh, and the peas and, yeah. And, I really and they want something. the other half of the plate to be that meat. So <laughs> make it a fourth of the plate the meat, a fourth of the plate your starch. This is a revelation Even for me if it's that just peas beautiful. are a starch. I, mean, I just didn't know that. Sorry. So the... Peas are a starch. The other weird part with starchies is like acorn squash, oh, yeah. spaghetti squash, the, um, the hard, hard shelled squashes. They are a starch, but their advantage over corn or peas is you get a whole cup of them for 15 grams of carbs. And mashed potatoes, unfortunately, peas and corn, a half a cup is 15. Oh, so man, that's all the mashed potatoes? Yeah. You know, I was well, gonna, I was going to invite you over for Thanksgiving, but I don't think I'm going to now. Well, you know, the other hard part too is sweet potatoes, the yellow potatoes. Uh -huh. They are a starch too. They have fiber. They have more vitamins because they're an orange vegetable instead of a white one. But carb-wise, they're the same, unless you put the brown sugar and the marshmallow in them. Now Ooh. they've got more carbs in it yeah. than a potato would have been. So that's where we got to be careful. It's our portions that get out of control. 
you know, if you look in the yard sales in the summer and you're at somebody that was older person's house and you go, oh, it's so sad the dessert plates are the only plates left. And you look around and you only see one dinner plate. The dinner plate used to be the serving platter. Our plates mm. are like 12 oh, inches wide. Oh, yeah. You know, what, you know, 60, 70 years ago was the dinner plate is what we need as a dinner plate. Because then when you put my poor little half a cup of mashed potatoes and my cup of vegetables and my poor little palm-sized piece of meat on a nine-inch plate, the food's falling off the plate. So your brain says, full plate, full tummy. You go to a movie theater and you're going to get the medium pop. Oh, I don't know if I would. I'm a little thirsty for it. Not small, but a medium. But in the medium, used to be yes. 16 ounces. Now it's a quart. Yep, and a small and, is the 16 or yeah. 20. And yeah, and that, that super sized, whatever it is that everybody walks around with, it's only a dollar. That dollar's not worth the insulin no. you're going to need in a few years. My theory there is that when we were kids, the parents wouldn't let you have pop. So when you become adults, it's, well, I can, I'm an adult now, I can do this. Well, and you know, they did point that out. The bottle of pop, when it came in glass bottles, used to only be seven or eight ounces, maybe 12 at the most. Because I remember pop used to be all, everyone shared a little bit of one bottle. Yeah. And now everybody has their own bottle. And you go to a restaurant and it's unlimited. Yeah, but then at gas stations, you used to only get gas. You couldn't right. buy dinner. And, and you could Not get that your you oil. Wanted, yeah. You could get your oil changed there. Now you I buy mean, once in a while they used to be lucky and have a pop machine with just those small six or eight right. ounce yeah, you're right. bottles. Yeah, so. it's hard. It's it, you know, the hardest thing is food is where we live. It's where we visit. It's how you it's share your hospitality. It was always a reward. It was never a okay, you've gotten an A, let's go over to the beach and pick up seashells, you know, or let's go for a walk mm -hmm. down at the creek. And even if you don't fish, go for a walk down where the fishing is, you know, go for a walk in our parks. We have some very beautiful green spaces and we're blessed because when you go to a big city, there's like, where is the green space? Yeah. You know, where is the grocery store? When you travel, if you're in a big city, it's hard to find a grocery store, you know, or thankfully some of the other stores have groceries. Even if you just walk, go for a walk someplace different or build up, you know, whatever you want to do for yourself and say, hey, after I make so many points with my activity at doing it after each meal, I'm going to go walk Mill Creek Mall or go over and walk the Ashtabula Mall or go down to walk um, Connie Out Lake, mm -hmm. you know, up at the lake or Geneva on the lake. Or We've got a lot of nice places to go for a walk couple of bucks and you can go walk at the walking program down in Spire if you've never been yeah. there. Or go down to the covered bridges. A lot of them have small parks right there where they are. So you can go and see our trees and our plants. You know, we, we forget that. And it's kind of scary. There's a whole generation of kids that are like, what do you do with not, this leaf? My, my grandkids, they come over and we've got 14 acres and it isn't long before they say, can we go out in the woods? How so wonderful. that's, and uh, for Halloween we did a, um, treasure hunt uh -huh. and they had to run out to this tree then run back in the house and then run out to that tree and then we have this little cabin in the woods which is probably a quarter of a mile out yeah. and they had to go to that but they had the best time I, I shot a video that I put on YouTube and nobody but my immediate family would want to watch it because it's too long and boring but it's like <laughs> I found another clue I found another clue <laughs> But you know, we can do that same thing with our own health, is make it fun for us. Yeah. You know, you mentioned and, apps. And, and do it, start early, get your kids to... to uh, yeah, and do it for yourself. You know, sometimes yeah. the most fun is pick up, an, uh, pick up something designed for a kid. Because it makes the, it's the same information for an adult, really. Portion sizes might be a little bit different, but they're done bright and colorful and fun and makes you want to engage in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, give yourself some playground time. You know, that's sadly lacking. After we start taking recess away from kids, yeah. we start training them to sit and do homework. Yeah. Sit and, and do we, a We've job. discussed this with different people, educators and health people on the show about how they, they, when I was in school, you got 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. You ate lunch at home, walked home, and when you came back, there was like 15 minutes because you always got back to school early before school starts, so you played on the playground oh, then yeah. too. 
And now yeah. it's like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and that's it for the day. Well, and if you're not in a sport after school, they don't have intramural for everybody to take that walk right. around the school building before you go home at the end of the day. And they're finding that, like, for the restlessness or the trouble concentrating, five or ten minutes, 15 minutes of that, just do something. Just yeah. have fun. Just play catch with yourself with the ball. Will help right. settle down the brain, settle down the and so they can learn. I, I mentioned before there was a study and somebody walks into a classroom and it's it's three o'clock and the, guy, the teacher's reading to the kids but they haven't had any exercise all day. And one girl's hitting herself in the head with a water bottle and other people are fidgeting around because they haven't had enough exercise. Yeah, but there's lots of if you if you have the internet, there are a lot of nice little things. If you go to some of the websites for safe, make sure they're safe. Mm -hmm. um, office exercises that you could do at home and some of the when you read them you're like really that's not going to do anything do them really yeah okay. the, the fun because I'm the guy that says really well there's there's one just getting up and out of a chair so if you're doing it at home make sure it's a solid chair that's not going to slide out from under you right but that simple stand up sit down and, and granted the best would be not getting all the way to sitting but start with all the way back to sitting make yourself stand up sit back down about the fourth time up you feel it you know that core is engaged your upper legs are going oh my goodness you want me to do this because if we don't do it the body says you didn't use it so i'm not keeping it yeah you know good analogy yeah the rest one of the trainers at premier says if you rest your rust <laughs> when, you, when you rest rest too long you have to rest enough to regenerate your system you got to get your best sleep you possibly can but when it's too much, our system starts to rust, and you notice that. You know, you don't have that same mobility. You don't have that same energy. You know, you got to tr train the lungs and the heart and the muscles to move. You know, retrain them. Right. Because we kind of trained it right out of our system. Right. But there's lots of wonderful apps that will help you guess better at mm -hmm. how many carbs, how much fat, how much salt is going on the plate. There's some apps you take a picture of the food and you can kind of put a little oh, note yeah. to yourself that said, you know, especially for people that are dosing insulin or checking blood sugars, um, it will do that. There's an app somewhere, and I haven't found it since I saw someone else using it, that lets you fill the plate. And it was a picture of the plate, and you kind of said what's on it, and it would estimate your carbs for you. You know, so when you can, use the food labels. When you can't, a half a cup by most foods is about a serving size except if this is rice or pasta or the potatoes that we talked about, then this half a cup would count as maybe two servings instead of one, if we're counting a serving being one carb choice. And of course, if it's the non-starchy veggies, you get a cup and a half yeah. of those green beans to be right. 15, or you get the half a cup of pizza. How about Brussels 15. sprouts? Brussels sprouts are the non-starchy veggies. All right. Although some people, and this is where it gets tricky, and that's where you use your meter, some people, the Brussels sprouts, they notice the blood sugar goes up afterwards. Some people, it doesn't change because everybody's body is a little bit okay. different. So just because <laughs> it doesn't work for one, you know, Brussels sprouts might be perfect for you, not so perfect for me. That doesn't mean that you can't eat them. It's what works for you. Okay. Okay, we got to thank you for coming on. Oh, Laura Gilhausen you. from Diabetes Education at ACMC. Uh, we have to take 